Physical violence never solves anything, Sarah. That's not entirely true. In what instance does it help? I'll give you an example. When my father hit me, it resolved a lot of things. Oh, Sarah, why did he do that? Because I was a bitchy little teenager. I wanted his attention, wanted him to want a relationship with me instead of focusing all of his energy on his political career. So I thought of the most hurtful things to say to him and I said them. And I said them until he knocked me to the floor. I'm so sorry, Sarah. Don't be. My father was a brilliant politician. Not so much a father. But I learned that that's okay. I turned out all right. All right, I want you to go work on your speech. I don't want you winging it anymore. You're not Donald Trump. I have great respect for women. Nobody has more respect for women than I do. Uh, so for the record, said, you're saying you never did that. things that frankly you better not have destroyed his inevitable win of the presidency. I mean, uh, she calls our people deplorable, a large group, and irredeemable. I will be a president for all of our people, and I'll be a president that will turn our inner cities around and will give strength to people and will give economics to people. I've heard from lots of teachers and parents about some of their concerns about some of the things that are being said and done uh, in this campaign. Uh, and I think it is very important for us to make clear to our children that our country really is great because we're good. We're going to move on to Syria. Both of you have mentioned that. Well, she said a lot of things. We, you, you I mean, I think we should we can, be allowed no, to maybe Mr. Trump, we're going to go on. This is she about the audience. Because a disaster as a Mr. Senator. Mr. Trump, a we're going to move on. The heartbreaking video of a five-year-old Syrian boy named Amran sitting in an ambulance after being pulled from the rubble, rubble after an airstrike in Aleppo focused the world's attention on the horrors of the war in Syria. If you were president, what would you do about Syria and the humanitarian crisis in Aleppo? You see the hate on this stage. The violence of words, and you don't have to wonder why it comes out in our actions as well. These two only know how to add gasoline to the fire. These are human beings we are talking about in the Middle East. People who are suffering, and you think they'll stop being aggressive if we cause them more pain? The war on terror is a war on ourselves. Terrorists are children who find themselves without a voice, without a good choice. Like a little girl whose father is ignoring her, never giving her any empathy or support, never listening to her. She is suffering, and he won't hear it. When that little girl gets frustrated enough, she comes up with something she can do to get his attention, to make him feel her pain of neglect. And she says just what he can't stand to hear. Fuck you, Dad. You're a terrible father, and I hate you. The father is triggered, and he smacks her in the face. And as she falls to the floor, she feels the pain, but she also feels the love that she wasn't getting any other way. And so in her physical pain, she feels relief at last. This is terrorism today. Confused children in pain who don't have any other way to be heard, lashing out for love. The war on terror is a war on our children. The children we bomb in the Middle East, the children they recruit to kill us, the children we send to kill them. And all the while, the one who could heal the situation is us, the father, the one with power, capable of turning the conversation from fear to love, from pain to healing. And yet, we talk about retaliation, airstrikes on our children and our children's children. It's madness, and we're infected by it. The only way out is through the pain, using love as our weapon. We have one more question from Ken Bone about uh, energy policy. Ken? 
Since John Haley's controversial words at the second debate, his popularity has risen dramatically. He's now polling in a dead heat with Clinton and Trump, a virtual three-way tie. Who's going to win this one? Hate, love, or the status quo? Great. And I'll be Sarah's accountability partner. Sarah? What? What? Would you like to say something? That's not protocol, Frank. Okay, fine. Don't say anything. What? You want to hear the dirt? You want to hear that I'm falling for John Haley? You want the deep, dark secrets so that you can feel like you know me? You want to hear the big scandal that ended my career 12 years ago? Fine. I was racing a good man for president. He was an underdog, just how I like him. And I groomed him, and I showed him exactly what he could be. Our opponent was stupid and cocky and underestimated us both. And I buried him with the dirt he didn't even know he had. We were up in the polls. We were in the home stretch. We were celebrating the success when suddenly I felt powerless to stop. We'd been friends all through the campaign, but now he had this swagger. He was going to be the leader of the free world, and it, he had this energy, and it pulled me in, and I couldn't resist it. And I know. It's my electric complex. I never got daddy's love, so I wanted a father figure to love me the way he never did, to fill the hole inside. True enough. But the label, it's never the thing itself. I loved that man. And everything was going fine until that backstabbing bitch betrayed us. She was going to be the first lady. Instead, she goes on live TV and destroys all of our careers. The cardinal rule of politics is never put personal relationships over politics. Right, Frank? I learned my lesson. Never race a horse unless you have the dirt on his wife. And never trust a woman. They're too emotional.